And uh, Aaron wrote, has this pandemic had disastrous effects on your kid? I feel like I've lost my kid. I feel like I don't even know the angry, controlling, unhappy kid who lives at our house. Um, I'm doing every single thing I can. Uh, therapy, meds, reading books, hiring help, etc. He's just getting worse and worse, despite me basically devoting all my energy into helping him. I feel like this can't be the normal progression of ADHD. Shouldn't he be making progress over time, even if he's behind his peers? Thank you so much, Erin. So yes, this is not your typical progression with ADHD, but Nothing is typical right now. We're living in abnormal circumstances. And so we're going to see a regression for all children, and particularly children who are alternative learners, uh, those with ADHD or learning disabilities, Asperger's, or who are on the spectrum, formerly Asperger's, and anxiety. So uh, we have to shift our expectations uh, for our kids and redefine what progress looks like. He's getting worse because he feels out of control, discouraged, and hopeless about his new life. I have a four-year-old girl in my practice who said to her parents, I want my old school and my old friends back. And that is pretty much how most kids are feeling, whether they're four, 14, 44. Uh, we all want our old school and our old friends back. So let me see who's joined us today. Priscilla is here, Cherie, Nicole, Deborah. Um, wow, you're from Trinidad in the West Indies. Fantastic. Uh, Lynn, you feel more impatient than angry at what info, information we're receiving about COVID, thinking that is not getting and not getting all the information at once. Angry uh, at the heat makes me ugly. <laughs> angry that the heat makes me ugly. Yes, angry uh, and the heat is not is not our best look, perhaps. Tara. Um, Let's see. Um, Sandrea Lee says, trying to get insight for your five-year-old daughter. I hope to help you with that. Tara would like to know how to respond when your son gets angry. We're getting to that. Um, uh, and let's see, Priscilla says, I'm an essential employee, so my daughter has to stay at daycare and they do nothing. Oh, that's terrible. And it drives her so crazy because she feels so bored. I want her to work on academics, but, um, with some fun, but it seems impossible because they don't want to do the work. Yes, uh, the kids don't want to do the work and the adults may not be doing the work. Matthew says, hi. Carrie says, is a school counselor and mom of an ADHD eight-year-old and also have a seven-year-old and a one-year-old, all boys. Oh, you're busy. So um, what we want to think about is... Um, is is that we are going to see increased anger, increased unhappiness, and a higher uh, level of um, non-cooperation uh, because kids are angry. And when they're angry, um, they're going to be angry at adults. And they're angry at adults because usually kids want their adults in their lives, and this comes from being a small baby, to make things better. When you're an infant and you're crying, your parent, your loving caretaker figures out if you're hungry, if you're tired, if you need a diaper change, or you just need to like step outside and have a change of environment. And so kids grow up with the expectation, understandably, that adults are people they can rely on to make things feel safe and secure. That reliance is not really available right now because we adults are struggling. We don't know what to expect. We feel compromised um, and angry ourselves. We're not getting information. Perhaps you're distressed because your particular state um, doesn't have consistent guidelines or rules. Schools aren't clear yet about what they're doing. There's a lot of anxiety about that. So what do you do when your kids are angry? And the first thing you're going to do when your kids are angry is manage yourself. Because if you're getting triggered when your kids are getting triggered, it's just a bonfire of, of, of anger and eruption. So what we want to do, what I want to recommend that you do first off is notice what are the signs that make you that make you aware that you're getting angry. And sometimes it happens like this. You actually can't control it before you're in it. That's okay. If you are already in anger and you are already yelling, stop. Make yourself stop 
and go to the bathroom. That's my favorite, my favorite intervention for adults. Everybody understands that people go to the bathroom, even though kids, some kids are very um, uncomfortable with the separation from their parents. They may bang on the door. They may yell at you. You need to pull yourself together because you cannot deal with your kids in any kind of logical clear way that you're going to feel good about if you're reacting. Okay, so that's the very first thing I want you to do. Um, so the second theme that I found in the comments from the community were frequent meltdowns, violent reactions, and inappropriate language. So Carolyn says, my seven-year-old has recently become very angry and violent, so we started him on medication during the week, week eight of the lockdown. He was diagnosed last summer, but he wasn't violent at all or very angry before the lockdown. Do you have tips on how to deal with someone with serious anger triggered over anything, violent outbursts, and utter defiance in the heat of a moment? So this is a great question, and I bet that some of you are, are dealing with this as well. So why kids are angry, I, especially you, you know, I think I've uh, talked about that. They want, they, they, they're they angry and they're going to take it out on someone with whom they feel safe, with someone who has protected them in the past, um, because you're, you're there, right? And you, even though this is not rational and it's unconscious, you're not able to make this better for them. So um, they're struggling to contain their big feelings. That's another reason they lash out because they're in the they're in the export business. They're going to export their um, really angry, uncomfortable feelings to you. And oftentimes what happens is parents import those feelings, get set off themselves, and then we're in that firestorm I was talking about. But they're also exporting those feelings to you because they can't contain them. And they need to know that you see their um, their struggle, that you're not going to shame them for it, that you acknowledge that things are hard. Nine times out of 10, what kids who are angry want is some kind of validation that they have a right to be angry or upset. Um, what happens a lot of times in families is parents to do the opposite. They want their kids to calm down and calm down quickly. And I don't know about you, but the worst thing my husband can say to me when I'm upset is, you need to calm down. Because essentially, I'd like to drop kick him out of the house and across the street to the park. Um, what would be more helpful for me in those moments, which I've t told him and he's actually learned really well, is to be able to say, I, I can see that you're really angry. What would help you um, dial it down right now? And that way, or I can understand why this set you off. We want to convey that kind of empathy first, okay? Um, and so nonetheless, you want to set limits about foul language and violence and set up a plan for making amends. So for example, I work with a family. There are three boys, two of whom have ADHD. And uh, these parents basically said, your phone is an earned privilege. If you use foul language the first time you get a warning, the second time I get your phone for the rest of the day. That's it. And they followed through on that. There Was there pushback initially? You bet. They, with a lot of help and support from me, texting and phone calls, I'm like, what should I do? He's screaming at me. I'm like, keep your steadiness, okay? So we want to keep steady. The other thing that we want to do is we want to help kids understand um, that they have other options when they're angry. They don't know what to do. Claire writes, my 12-year-old goes from zero to 60 without any warning. Um, his anger increases as he roams the house saying, what can I do? What can I do? We try making lists of go-to activities, but no, he never tries them. So he is actually showing you with your be his words and his behavior, he doesn't know what to do with all of these feelings. And so uh, in a calm moment, um, it, it, you know, I think the lists are a great idea. Like you could try this or you could try that. Uh, but since he's not doing that, in a calm moment, sit down with him and say, here's what I observe is happening. You're 
you're, go, you're getting angry really fast. I understand. I get that way too, or your dad gets that way too. Um, and in the moment, you, I can see that you don't know what to do to calm yourself down. And so we have this list, but somehow that's not really working. What, what, what about the list doesn't work for you? What do you think might be a better a better kind of agreement. Um, and maybe the list is too many choices. Maybe he just needs to be able to do one, you know, A, go outside and shoot basketballs. B, go up to his room and, and listen to music. You know, sim- maybe simplifying it. But f- first and foremost, asking him what would help him manage his anger. Um, uh, so, um Let's see. Um, The other thing that I wanted to say is that sometimes when kids are angry, particularly younger kids with ADHD, but not necessarily just younger kids, ironically, what they really want is a hug. So I worked with a family where there were... um, where there was a, a, a boy uh, with ADHD and, he, and ha- he had an older sister and a younger sister. And they were in a long, they would take long car trips to go see um, the, the, father's gra- the father's parents. And in the course of the car trip, you know, at some point, um, the boy with ADHD, he was about nine at the time, would just, you know, unravel. And he would get really silly and he would do silly things and he would yell things or sing songs or talk about, you know, farting and burping and stuff like that. And the sisters would laugh or they would tell him to be quiet. And there was all this hullabaloo and the father is trying to drive and he is, uh, he was a single dad and he would get so angry that he would like throw whatever was in the front seat back at the, the seat behind him where his son was sitting to get him to stop because he would say, stop, stop, and the sun didn't stop. So we had a session or two about this. And in the middle of that session, what happened is I asked the son, what do you think would help you? And he, I said, you know, what if we had, you, your dad had pulled off at the next exit and gotten out of the car and you'd gotten out of the car, what would have helped you calm down? And he said, a hug. And the father said, that's a big ask because I'm pretty angry. And I said, I know, it's a huge ask, but he is telling you what he needs. So we want to try to get a sense from kids of what that is. And I will say to this family's credit and this father's credit that the next time they were in the car going to visit the grandparents and things played themselves out in a similar way, he did get off the road, stopped at his, uh, you know, those... Um, you know, gas station or whatever, got out of the car and had had his son get out of the car and said, okay, what's going to help right now? And he said, I want that hug. And he gave him a hug. It was hard, but he did it. So let me see what some of you are asking. Um, so uh, what I have is, um, Deborah says, I'm a mom of a 13-year-old girl, a 13-year-old boy, excuse me. He becomes really angry when he is in conflict with another child or person, and he is corrected for responding the wrong way to the situation. One example this week, he's playing with some boys. One started telling him mean things about me, and he responded by hitting the child. The parent came to correct me, child, and he became so angry, shouting at the parent, at me and everyone because we intervened. The other child was the wrong one because he started it. Okay, so your son has a clearly a you know pretty strong sense of justice. Um, so one of the things that's hard for kids with ADHD or any kids is that they respond impulsively, right? They, they're they mad that this kid is saying something bad about you, so boom, they hit the child or... Um, yell at the child or say something inappropriate. Um, In that moment, correcting them about what he should have done, in particularly if it's in front of other people, is going to provoke a rage reaction. And that rage reaction is because he's already angry and now you've added shame onto it and shame and anger equal rage. So what you wanna do is instead state your observations Ask each child, excuse me, ask each child to state what had happened, share your observations, and ask them, how can we move forward? 
what would an apology of action look like? Because both kids were actually wrong here. He just acted physically, but the other kid was taunting him. And it's very hard for kids with ADHD to deal with teasing and taunting without getting physical. So your son probably needs some skills. He needs a comeback or two that's in his back pocket, you know, when someone says something that provokes him. But he also needs a sense of justice. And justice would be, you know, listening to both sides and discussing how you can move forward together. Um, let's see. Uh, Claire, okay, how can parents help impulsive behaviors? Um, so, you know, that's a big question. Um, when kids are impulsive, um, they are, um, they are acting before they're thinking, right? And they're acting before they're thinking because their frontal lobes, the seat of our executive function skills, are just not fully matured. So what we want to do is try to have bring into awareness an, an impulsive behavior that distresses your child. Because the thing is, what helps kids move forward on changing behaviors is when they actually don't like something about themselves and they want to change that. That's that collaboration that's essential. So let's say your child doesn't like that he um, will, uh, will, will kick, um, kick his father when his father tells him to do something that he doesn't want to do. And the father also doesn't like it. That would be a place to start. What else could he do when he feels like kicking? So as the leg comes out, what could you say that would be kick? You know, that would that alert him. Hey, kicking. What else? Can, what's that? What are you going to do instead? Or elephant or whatever code word you're going to create so that he could switch to the other choice. Um, what do you do when a child hits a sibling, five-year-old hitting a three-year-old? So, you know, um, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a fan of, of hitting. I also know that it happens in families. Um, and kids, are, kids naturally will, will get into skirmishes with their siblings. Um, when you have an age difference, it's particularly difficult because the bigger, older child can actually hurt the younger child. Um, in my house, actually, ironically, um, my dog, <laughs> My son would taunt my daughter. He would tease my daughter when they were little. They're four years apart. And, um, you know, he, you know about how he was, you know, sort of smart. I mean, he was four years older. He had a lot more skills than she did. And she would bite him. It was, it was really uh, very challenging. And we had a rule, you know, there's no biting. There was no hitting. Um, and when that happened... It was a time apart for everybody. Everybody sat down. Um, people went to different places to try to chill out. And then we would come back together and talk about um, how you could use your words instead of your body. Um, that's a really important phrase for younger children. What can you, what use your words instead of your body? Okay. And what would your words say? Um, what was happening? What would you have liked to see happen? How do you want to make it up? If a five-year-old is hitting a three-year-old, it's very easy for your five-year-old to make amends. And making amends is important. This is part of apologies of action. And for kids who struggle with their anger, learning how to make it right is important. They're not going to be able to take back what they did or said. But what they can do is an apology of action. I'm going to show you with an alternative behavior um, that I'm sorry. And so a five-year-old could maybe read to, read to a sibling or play a game that the sibling wants to do. Do color or do an art project or a puzzle with the sibling. You're going to pay it back in terms of time and attention. Um, Cherie says, I think you make a great point of finding out what works for your particular child. My daughter, four years old, wants nothing to do with hugs when she's angry. That's right. Some kids don't want hugs. They just want to be able to lie on the floor and, and, and you know, act it out. Or maybe they want to withdraw. You know, let's find out what works for your particular child. Um, Kara asks, how do I keep everyone safe, me and another child, when my son is having an outburst? He will break things if left alone. That's a really good question. Now, of course, I assume in your house, Kara, that breaking things is not acceptable, right? So um, what are the consequences for your son when he breaks things? Uh, and um, 
what else could he do to express express his anger? I worked with a family, and this the child had a lot had a lot of anger issues, um, and actually uh, would you know kick doors, break things as well. And we um, you know we figured out that there were other ways for him to express his anger, whether it was uh, on the trampoline, you know, which they got a small trampoline. Uh, one family got you know a a, a punching bag or some inflatable thing that he could hit in the basement or in his room. So we want to try to figure out how you can take that energy and get it out appropriately. Can you ride your bike around up and down the driveway? You know, Can you run around the yard? What are some of the other options? Um, Carrie says, defiance and disobedience from a very intelligent eight-year-old. Uh, he feels he is in control and should always make the choices. How do you handle that? Almost like he doesn't see a difference between himself and authority figures. Well, this is a, 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 great, um, a, a great question. Um, so, you know, around the age of eight, uh, seven or eight, kids are starting to be aware that they actually have, um, you know, some autonomy, okay, that they can do things that they weren't able to do. And that's the beauty of this, the, what we call the latency phase of childhood, which is, you know, eight to 10. Kids are actually really learning important skills about how to live in the world. Um, so, but he's, 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 he's not an adult, right? But he is, um, he feels, he wants control because internally, my guess is he feels very out of control. So I would encourage you to give him some areas that are appropriate for an eight-year-old to control. What are appropriate areas for an eight-year-old to control? His body, what he wears, um, uh, you know, um, foods that he might want to eat if he could go grocery shopping with you, activities, you know, friends he wants to play with, who he wants to play with, what to do when they're together, maybe uh, an activity that he could pick uh, for the family or a movie that he could pick or making popcorn. You want to you want to shift that desire for control into the area where it should be, which is learning skills and being able to have some independence, not in controlling everything. And I think it's reasonable to say to a kid, look, here's the deal. There are some things that you can take care of, and there are some things that I take care of, because my job as your parent is to make sure you're safe, you're healthy, um, you have food, clothing, love, education, shelter, right? Those are some of my things. Here are some of your things. And I encourage you to talk with your, if you have a co-parent, a partner, or somebody you're, uh, uh, um, you live with, um, to be able to uh, discuss with them what are the areas where your child could show some independence um, that's appropriate. Um, Melissa asks, how should parents turn them around when they're determined to be right? So there's a funny saying in, in the psychology world, which is, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And none of us are right all the time. So the desire to be right usually comes from an insecurity that you're wrong, right? There, there are many times where you feel like you don't measure up, you don't get it right. You're different, i.e. worse than other people. So let's try to create some areas where your child can be right. What are some things that they can be right about? And why is being right important? Being right is important to tweens because they want autonomy. They are just beginning, and often immaturely so, to feel like, wow, look at me, I can do things. This, they've sort of graduated from that stage of, of, of childhood where they're learning skills, you know, 8 to 11. They get to 12, 13, 14, they're like, huh, well, look at all the stuff I know. And so they lose track that they, that they want to be right so that they can feel that they have some power and authority. There are a lot of things that they can be right about, but the issue is, you know, what is the value of being right for your child? Um, um, Deborah says, uh, my son most times never see never sees what he does as wrong. So I think that, that that dichotomy of right and wrong is a very challenging one for kids with ADHD. And it's challenging for kids with ADHD because they already feel like they're wrong a lot. 
So if you can shift it from what's working, from what's right and wrong to what's working and what's not working, I think you'll have a little bit better um, uh, progress. Um, because when you make it about being right or wrong, then you get into issues of, of fairness, um, justice, and you don't trust me. And that is, that's not the path to go down. Okay. The path to go down is, is this working? If it's not working, what would work better? Is this effective? If this isn't effective, what would be better? And what does it, why does it matter to you to be right? What's important about being right? I'm always curious when I meet with particularly tweens, what, what is it about being right? I'm working with a family now, and the 13-year-old is frequently yelling at her parents in session, two parents, about how they misinterpret a situation that they both agree went one way and she agrees went another. And I redirect them and I say, okay, look, there's three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. Instead of looking for the sides, let's look at the situation and what you might have liked to do differently, what you felt went well and why, and how you want to see it play out in the future. Um, okay, uh, Erica says, my son and I are both disabled. Uh, at times we get frustrated at being disabled. How can we stay encouraged and still seek resources we need to be successful? Well, um, that sounds uh, complicated, Erica. And what I would say to you is, um, you know, owning who you are, what, what you need, and what helps you get through every day is 80% of, of the work that you need to do. Um, to stay encouraged, I would encourage the two of you at dinner each night to go to, to, to go around and notice one or two things. I like to do um, three things at the end of every day. I keep a journal of three things that went well. And they don't have to be fabulous, but, you know, it might be um, I liked my dinner. And it might be, you know, wow, I, you know, Facebook Live went, went, went swimmingly. Um, but you want to try to shift your attention a little bit to what is going well. So try to start with an exercise super simple at dinner, which is maybe a high and a low, a rose and a thorn, as it were. So you can start to notice that there are things that are going well, and those can encourage you to keep on your path. Um, let's see. Nicole asks, looking for good uh, ideas for good transitions, especially from screen time. Here you're on that one. We use a timer and a point er reward system he earns when he turns it off when we ask, excellent, um, or turns it off independently without leading to anger. Fantastic. A transition from a transition per se. So one of the things that you might want to do, uh, there are a couple things you can do to help kids transition off screens. One is, I love that he earns points. Um, earning a reward for getting off without yelling is a great, great idea. Um, getting off the screen, which is a high dopamine, uh, re, you know, very rewarding activity, to something else. Okay, so what is that something else? Could it involve you? For younger kids, yes. For older, for teens, maybe, maybe not. It could involve you if it's something that interests them. Let's go for ice cream or, hey, you know, we're going to play a game. So you help transition them. That's one thing. The second thing is that they could talk out loud to themselves and say, I'm turning off my game and I'm walking into the other room so that they can actually coach themselves. What could they say to themselves? A third thing would be just to put a hand on their chest and say, I'm leaving one activity and one area of the house. I'm going to something else. So that there's a clear demarcation between screen time and what's next. Um, Sandra Lee says, I'm hearing that I need to find some avenues for more independence for my six-year-old, and I hadn't thought of that. Great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandria and Melissa, they also said it was helpful. Great. Um, Kimberly asks, what are some anger management tools, diversions for a 10-year-old? So um, I spoke about this a little bit e earlier. So 10-year-olds, um, you know, they, they, they are, they're angry. They, they know that they're angry. They probably don't like it. So you might want to um, post a list in the kitchen of things they can do when I'm starting to get angry, once I'm, you know, ticked off, and what to do um, to help myself calm down. It, it, you know, some kids will respond to a list of a couple of tips better than others, but we mostly want to make sure 
that your child can think of options because in that moment of the amygdala hijack, right, the the emotional brain has taken over the thinking brain. And so you can't recall things that you decided to do or you've done in the past that have helped you calm down. Emotional control, that executive functioning skill, is inherently linked to working memory. And so many people with ADHD struggle with working memory. So we can use some cues in that moment. Maybe they would respond to a post-it if you wrote something on a post-it. Maybe there could be a, a, a jar with some ideas and they could pull one out and do that. I, I don't know, but it's worth talking to them about. You know, it's very important when your kids are angry that you don't take it on and engage with them about the thing that they're mad at you for. Well, no, that's not how it went, or I didn't say that, or, you know, when instead what you want to say is, I can see that you're really angry. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that uh, what happened has made you so angry or what I said made you angry. We're going to figure a way to work this out. You're gonna, you want to try to actually lower the volume. And when you're calmer, you can do that. It's very important to try to re redirect your kids. And when we take things personally, we cannot do that. And I, I want to say, like, I'm still learning this, and my kids are 21 and um, 25. It's hard, hard, hard to do this. So, um, okay. So, uh, Claire, so Claire says, for my son, he will become so angry, unreasonably so, and it really boils down to him not getting what he wants when he wants it. Mm. Uh, he wants to do a science experiment now or build something, play a game or whatever he wants now. Right. So we know that the ADHD brain is a now, not now brain. If it's happening now, oh my God, I've got it. I, I want this now. I want to do it right now. There's no later. I can't wait. So we have to teach them how to adapt to, 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 to actually pausing, to, to um, counting perhaps for something to happen. Um, he wants to do his thing right now. Okay, what can we do between now, the desire, and making it happen? That's a conversation to have not in that heated moment, but at a separate time. When you really want to do something right then, Let's talk about how we can do that because sometimes that can happen and sometimes it can't. When it can happen, we don't have a problem. When it can happen, that's when we have a problem. And so what I want to do is come up with some alternatives. Perhaps he has difficulty waiting. Perhaps he doesn't believe that the thing that he wants will actually occur. So we want to find out why the now is so important and how to teach him, almost how to distract himself so that he could wait. Um, uh, any hints for a 14-year-old who's failed freshman year? Um, yes, uh, I will do that. And uh, Tara says, my 17-year-old very intelligent son is completely bored with school. We tried traditional and charter schools. It didn't work. He'd sleep through class. Now he we homeschool. He lacks the motivation to do any schoolwork anymore. Says he's in a funk. Won't get won't work anymore since he got fired. Oh, he's having a hard time. Gets a feeling of accomplishment from video games. Yeah. Uh, how can I get him to be motivated to do school? Tried the carrot and the stick, neither works. Feeling scared and defeated. Okay. So I want to um, just to say something about, um, uh, okay. Um, I want to say something about um, these two teenagers who have not succeeded at school. So, um, you know, this is a long, a short, a short question with a long answer, right? And um, right now, because school is so odd, um, you know, with the hybrid learning and we don't know what's happening. Um, so kids who are failing school feel terrible about themselves. Nobody wants to fail. You think about it. Would you rather do well or would you rather do poorly? Of course, you'd rather do well. So, you know, for a kid who's failed or a kid who um, hates school and then got fired from his job, their self-esteem is very low. And I would assume that they're, they're at a significant risk for depression. Um, and so finding them somebody to talk to and maybe consulting with your pediatrician or primary care provider about medication would be very important to do. When kids have failed and when they've experienced failure in a number of different areas, we have to work 
triply hard to find an area where they feel successful. And he feels successful at video games because video games are 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 um, are are something that uh, the goal is very clear and simple. You reach that goal, you go on to the next level. Um, you can master it. And if he's interested in computer stuff, maybe he would be interested in um, in learning um, learning how to do graphic. Um, graphic design or something that involves computers. Um, maybe he would be interested in taking a class on how to how to create your own game. Let's try to work with something that he feels competent at and build that and then and then sort of translate that sense of of, of improved self-esteem to other areas. Uh, when a 14-year-old has failed freshman year, to me the issue or when a school has a, a, a child has really you know, not, not been successful at school. There are, it's not, it usually gets sort of laid onto the child. But the issue is actually that the adults and the system has failed the child. They are not able to meet the child where the child is. And I say child even though these are teens. So we want to, um, we want to take the burden off the kid and shift it to a system and maybe engage in a different system. So for some kids with ADHD, traditional and charter schools are still not the right thing because they're very academically oriented. They might do better at vocational high schools, um, a vocational high school where they're learning, you know, how to, to be an autom automotive uh, um automotive mechanic or learning how to do some engineering or maybe learning graphic design and working with computers. Those kinds of programs can be more motivating and engaging for students, particularly students who are alternative learners. And they balance that kind of experiential learning with academic requirements. Um, I'd encourage you to look into that. Um, let's see. Uh, a timer can help with the now and not now agreed and particularly a time timer because you can see okay now is in the red and when the white is this much uh, I'm, I'm gonna come help you Deborah asks what would you suggest to move away from abusive language when he's angry he says a lot of mean hurtful things wishing death or severe harm at everyone me his sister and grandmother that two minutes after he act then two minutes after that he acts as if nothing had happened I can never understand that yeah so um, his abusive language is essentially like uh, this the a, 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 a valve a steam and, and it's, like, it's like steam coming out of your tea kettle and once it's out it's gone. It's evaporated for him. So he doesn't actually see the effect of his words or his behavior on other people. And even if you tell him that his words and his behavior are hurtful to other people, it, it, I don't get a sense from what you're saying that's sinking in. So instead, what I would do is move toward apologies of action. When you use that kind of language, um, the, the in, in order for us to, to to see and understand that you're sorry for what you did, um, and um, and I know you're acting like nothing happened because that's what you wish it were, because the shame of the explosion is so intense. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Here's two or three activities. You're going to help me unload the dishwasher. You're going to help me fold the laundry. You're going to help me go to the grocery store. Some way in which he pays you back. Now I want to say something about um, some of the adult comments that came in. Um, and um, it's uh, 440 so I have about five minutes left. Um, so people asked um, with adult adults with ADHD sent in a number of things. Um, uh, one person said, I specifically need help with emotional regulation. I find that I'll get stuck in an emotion, usually irritation or anger, and I have a hard time shaking it off, says Elizabeth. It's kind of like you get on this hamster wheel and you're going around and you can't like get off to the water thing, you know, <laughs> that the hamsters are a feed or something. So one of the things that um, we can do when we're emotionally regula dysregulated is have a very clear, very simple three-step... I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do this. Um, and I think that that's helpful, and I would put that on some post-its in different places in your life. I'd also encourage you to start meditating or doing yoga or something that helps you 
regulate your system. So maybe what you want to do in that moment is do some alternate nostril breathing. I know I've talked about this before. It's from yoga. You breathe in. You breathe out. If you're in a public place and you don't want to do that, you could put your hand on your belly and breathe into your hand. Um, I did it, I said going to the bathroom, washing your face, washing your hands, um, getting a drink of water can always be helpful. Just change your, your location. Um, uh, uh, when people get emotion overwhelmed and irrationally angry, they they feel to, they feel like um, they they have no control. And when you what you can't stand that feeling, right? It's a very scary feeling for kids. They they can surrender to that feeling, but they hate it. Like they're terrified, right? Um, uh, but they don't know how to stop. Adults don't like that feeling either, and they also don't know how to stop. Except with our fully matured brain, we have a few more coping skills. So instead of going into a shame spiral when you're dysregulated, you look at your, your little tips and try to do one of those things. I'd encourage you to make a playlist of songs to play when you're angry, things that might help you sort of like dance it out or walk it out or just sing it out alone in your car at the top of your lungs or songs that would calm you down. That can help as well. Um, and someone else wrote, uh, "I've lo uh, lose letting go of what we can't control." And I think this is a really good thing for us to end on because a lot of us um, can't. You know, we feel like sometimes we can't control our children, and um, you try to be compassionate, you try to remind them, you try not to lose your temper, and you're human, right? This compassion has to start with yourself. So um, this person wrote, I have lost my two outlets for mindfulness that keep me sane in normal times. Also due to vulnerability, status of my husband and my elder daughter, I've been responsible for all the food shopping for the household. This has meant I have to navigate supermarkets and the idiots that populate them. The experience has been terrifying and traumatic. I need help learning how to let go of what we cannot control. This is very tough with the th emotions of ADHD and extreme circumstances. I feel injustice deeper and angrier than most people. Um, letting go of the anxiety, anger, and frustration is particularly hard, even if you know you cannot do anything to stop the trigger from occurring. And that's right. You, you, it, it's very, very frustrating. And it's hard. I'm not saying this is easy. When we are angry like that, it's often a combination of not just being triggered and, you know, having a quick reaction, being provoked, but it's also about powerlessness. And powerlessness is frightening. It's uncomfortable. It's frustrating and it's confusing. So instead of aiming to let go of control, which to me is a completely unrealistic goal, soften your grip. You know, instead of saying, I have to let it go, just loosen a little bit. You can hold on, but just loosen a little bit. Um, so um, uh, I also wanted to say um, that things are really unjust, especially right now. And um, they're unjust in terms of our, the COVID. There's, they're unjust socially in terms of uh, economics, racial injustice, um, ho housing, food insecurity. There's a lot of injustice. And it, is, it, it makes us angry and rageful and powerless. We can't stop these triggers from occurring, just like we can't stop our kids being triggered by things. All we can do is adjust our reactions to it and intervene so we don't feel, um, so we don't launch into shame and humiliation. Because when you launch into shame and humiliation, it's not going to teach you the skills you need. Give yourself time and space and specific things to do when you are triggered and help your kids with that also. This is what will help us uh, accommodate to the loss of control that we're experiencing right now and to managing our anger. Thank you so much for joining.